On June 24, 1974, 14-year-old Margaret Ellen Fox took a bus from Burlington to Mount Holly, New Jersey to work a babysitting job for a man named John Marshall. She never returned home. Her family contacted the Marshall residence only to discover the number they'd been given rang a payphone outside of a grocery store. When police were notified, massive searches were conducted in Mount Holly and surrounding areas, but no trace of Margaret could be found. Four days after her disappearance, Margaret's abductor phoned the family and made a ransom demand of $10,000. Shortly after gathering the money, the family received a letter canceling the deal, and then they never heard from the abductor again. It didn't take long for investigators to determine that John Marshall had been a fake name, and they had absolutely no idea who could have taken Margaret. Over the next 45 years, the details surrounding Margaret's disappearance has haunted the Fox family and the state of New Jersey. While the case has grown cold, recent times have taught us that even the coldest cases can be solved decades later. This is Trace Evidence, Episode 96, The Disappearance of Margaret Ellen Fox. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today we examine the disappearance of 14-year-old Margaret Ellen Fox. And as I'm sure you can tell by my voice, I'm still getting over a cold, so apologies about that. Before getting into the case, just a few notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focusing on a different unsolved case each week. If you have questions, comments, or case suggestions, email me at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. You can also follow me on Twitter at TraceEvPod, on Instagram at TraceEvidencePodcast, or join the Facebook discussion group simply by searching for Trace Evidence. You can visit the website at trace-evidence.com for full episodes, social media links, merchandise, and more. As a final note, Trace Evidence is a complete one-man operation, so if you'd like to help support the podcast, please visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash traceevidence, where you can gain rewards such as stickers, pins, and other surprises. If Patreon isn't your thing, but you still want to pitch in, there is a PayPal donation button on the website. Today we examine a 45-year-old child abduction that remains as haunting and mysterious today as it was when it happened back in 1974. This is episode 96, The Disappearance of Margaret Ellen Fox. Margaret Ellen Fox was raised in Burlington, New Jersey, a city tucked against the western edge of the state and just across the Delaware River from neighboring Pennsylvania. Born on February 4, 1960, Margaret, or Mary as she was often called, was a bright, determined, and caring child who, despite her small stature, was able to roughhouse along with her four brothers, some older and some younger. According to her younger brother, Joe, Margaret often spent her free time playing with her siblings. In the summers, it was swimming in the backyard pool and trips out of town. In the winter, Margaret would strap on skates and go ice skating with her siblings and even sledding. Margaret would grow into being a very sharp young woman, focused and determined. She had dreams and goals and didn't hesitate to do what she could to accomplish them. In the early part of 1974, the 14-year-old had taken piano lessons while also enjoying her time learning how to ride horses. She was an eclectic mix and in a way may have been trying to distinguish herself as the feminine presence in a very testosterone-heavy family. In an interview with the Burlington County Times, younger brother Joe would explain, quote, She was struggling with four brothers and everything and trying to find her identity. And that's what she wanted, you know, was to go babysitting and make money so she could buy clothes and do stuff. End quote. Margaret finished up eighth grade in the early half of June, having attended St. Paul School in Burlington City. After the summer, she'd be stepping into high school and taking the next steps towards her future. But before school could begin again, she had plans for the summer. In hopes of making some pocket change and, as her brother mentioned, being able to go out or shop as she pleased, she began looking around for babysitting jobs. While her parents were extremely protective of the family, 
It wasn't exactly easy for Margaret to convince them to allow her to go to a stranger's home to babysit their children, but Margaret was determined. After many attempts, Margaret's parents agreed to allow the 14-year-old to take out an ad in a local newspaper advertising her availability as a babysitter. It didn't take long for calls to come in inquiring as to Margaret's availability, though ultimately, the one call which would forever change the course of her life and bring an inexorable darkness to Burlington was not originally intended for her. Initially, Margaret's cousin had been in discussions to take a babysitting job, but elected not to pursue it since it was out of town. I did read one particular article about this in which it was said that the cousin may also not have taken the job, as the man who called seemed upset about her age, with her being only 11 at the time. Some have been led to believe this could have played a role in his selection process. However, for Margaret, travel wasn't much of an issue. While Mount Holly was one town over, it was a short seven-mile bus ride, and Margaret was excited about the opportunity. Margaret's father, David Fox, was less than excited about the job. Initially, it seemed straightforward enough. The caller, who identified himself as John Marshall, offered $40 a week, plus the cost of bus fare, to watch his five-year-old son from the hours of 9.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. According to Marshall, his wife would pick up Margaret at the bus stop, located at the intersection of High and West Broad Streets in Mount Holly. From there, Margaret would be driven to the home to watch the child, and sometime between 2 and 2.30 p.m., Marshall or his wife would give Margaret a ride home. Margaret was excited, not only about the job, but Marshall also explained that the child could bring her bathing suit, as there was a pool in the backyard as well as a swing set, and his son enjoyed both swinging and going for a swim. Margaret was initially hired on Wednesday, June 19th to begin work that Friday, the 21st. But on the 20th, Marshall would call the Fox home to postpone the job until Monday the 24th due to an alleged death in the family. When Marshall called to change the starting date for the first time, Margaret's father got to speak with him. Both Dave and his wife, Mary, were able to speak to Marshall and according to later interviews, during the call, Dave was trying to get a sense of what type of person he was. It was a lot to allow his younger daughter to go there unchaperoned, and so he wanted to get to know the employer more deeply. Reportedly, there were no red flags during the conversation, and while Dave still wasn't exactly comfortable with the situation, he felt there was nothing to indicate that there could be a problem. However, that didn't change his protective nature, and in a later interview, he explained that Margaret fought against that, saying, quote, we guarded them too closely, maybe. She used to say we protected her too much. As I think back, it didn't seem like we did anything wrong in letting her go. It was daylight. End quote. I think it's important to note here just for a moment, we're talking about 1974. It was a different world, and while Margaret's parents were certainly involved in keeping her safe, there wasn't a stigma about allowing your child to ride a bus to babysit for a stranger the way there would be today. And ultimately, we're talking a distance of seven miles. It's not as though she was driving across the state. 11-year-old Joe Fox, Margaret's younger brother, walked to the bus stop with his sister that morning. She was set to take the 8.40 a.m. bus, arriving in Mount Holly just prior to 9 a.m., at which time she'd been instructed to proceed to a red Volkswagen driven by Marshall or his wife. The car would be waiting at the corner, and Margaret would then be driven to the house. Young Joe Fox recalled walking with his sister that morning and later stated, quote, She was excited. There was definitely not even an inkling she was running away. It just wasn't what was happening. End quote. This would be the last time Joe ever saw his sister, watching as the 14-year-old, clad in her maroon jeans, brown sandals, blue floral pattern top, and checkered jacket, disappeared into the crowded bus. John Marshall had provided a phone number to the Fox family so they could call Margaret if there were any issues or if they needed to reach her. Margaret herself was instructed by her parents to make sure to call them as soon as she arrived at the Marshall home on Monday morning, but that call would never come, and this would be the first indicator that something was very wrong. After waiting what felt like an appropriate amount of time, assuming the bus hadn't been delayed, Dave and Mary Fox dialed up the number provided to them by Marshall. The phone simply rang until it was eventually picked up by a passerby, as it was at this time the family discovered the number provided was not for a home, but for a payphone 
later tracked by police to just outside of a grocery store in the town of Lumberton, 10 miles from Burlington and some two miles south of Mount Holly, where Margaret was supposed to have been going. Margaret was supposed to be home by 2.30, but when that time came and went, panic began to set in. Dave Fox reached out to a friend who worked for the East Hampton Police Department, and the two drove over to Mount Holly, searching for Margaret. Initially, while there was growing concern for Margaret's whereabouts, there was also a sense of waiting to see, as was sort of the air of the time. She was 14 years old, and there were some who considered the possibility that she could have run away, or maybe had simply gone on an outing and failed to notify anyone. But as hours continued passing, that likelihood seemed to evaporate. Margaret wasn't the type of child to run off, and according to investigators, she had a very close and loving relationship with her family. It just didn't seem to fit that she would have gone off somewhere and not told anyone. The discovery that the phone number given traced to a payphone set off alarm bells, and soon both law enforcement and members of both the Burlington and Mount Holly communities were out searching door-to-door for Margaret. For the Fox family, it was their worst nightmare come true, as they showed photos of their daughter to everyone they came across, looking for any clues, but no clues could be found, and no one seemed to know where Margaret Fox was. A few witnesses would eventually be located who recalled seeing the teenager near the corner of Mill and High Streets, around where she was supposed to meet the man who called himself John Marshall. But beyond that, no one had seen anything. After officially filing a missing persons report, which they were able to do just after midnight on June 25th, police began to consider the possibility that Margaret may have been the victim of a targeted abduction. In response to this, they made the choice to wire the Fox family home and record all calls coming in and going out. For several days, the search for Margaret intensified, but investigators weren't getting anywhere. It was as if the moment Margaret stepped off the bus, she simply vanished. There were no sightings beyond the bus stop. Detective Leonard Burr was quickly assigned Margaret's case and made his first moves by riding the bus along the same route Margaret would have taken, hoping that some of those on the bus may be daily commuters who could have run into Margaret the previous day. Indeed, Burr spoke to several witnesses who remembered seeing the teenager riding the 840 bus and exiting at her scheduled stop. One particular witness, according to the Burlington County Times, described an incident in which her young son grabbed a handful of Margaret's hair, who was seated in front of them. According to the witness, Margaret turned and struck up a conversation. She would later describe Margaret saying, quote, her eyes were like smiley eyes, like someone that was happy, end quote. A second witness that Detective Burr spoke to got a different look, however. According to this witness, after stepping off the bus, Margaret approached a young man in a red sports car. It was believed at the time that since the car was red, Margaret asked the man if he was John Marshall. While not many details about this encounter have ever been revealed, Frankly, much of the details of this investigation have been held in tight secrecy. It was later reported that police were able to track this man down and interview him. After questioning him thoroughly, police were convinced he was not the man who had abducted Margaret, nor was he the man who had called and claimed to be John Marshall. Unfortunately, this sighting of Margaret speaking to that man is the last sighting listed in her police files. Detective Burr was frustrated by the lack of information he was finding, spending most of the first day on the bus or at the bus stops, showing images of Margaret and asking if anyone may have seen her. It was his feeling at the time that more people had likely seen her, but simply didn't want to get involved in a long conversation with the police. He would later comment about that, saying, quote, they just don't want to be bothered, so they keep their mouth shut, end quote. For David Fox, however, he was determined to find answers. The search for his daughter would become a lifelong pursuit, with his car windows being collaged with images of Margaret, and he took every opportunity to hand out flyers, ask questions, and plaster Margaret's image wherever he could. Dave Fox believed that eventually he would find his daughter, and there was nothing that was going to stop him. In hopes of tracking down any potential leads, investigators did something out of the ordinary for them. Detective Burr later explained that on four separate occasions, there were meetings held with a so-called psychic. While discussions with the psychic didn't lead to any major developments, 
Burr acknowledged his own apprehension about going down that path, later clarifying it by saying, quote, I wasn't really sure I wanted to get involved in something like that, and then I thought, you know, I've got nothing, what could it hurt? End quote. Four days after Margaret went missing, on June 28th, the FBI was called in to assist with the investigation. June 28th would also be the day that it was confirmed an abduction had taken place. Due to the decision by law enforcement to record all calls to the home, they were able to capture the abductor, the man who claimed to be John Marshall, when he called the home and made a ransom demand of $10,000. In 2019 money, that would be just over $52,000. The audio from that call remained in the possession of the FBI until this past June, when, on the 45th anniversary of Margaret's abduction, they released the clip to the public in hopes that someone would recognize the abductor's voice. I'm now going to play the clip for you, and being that it's so short, I'm going to play it three times. Normal speed, then slowed down, and then normal speed again. $10,000 might be a lot of bread, but your daughter's life is the butter topic. Who is it? $10,000 might be a lot of bread, but your daughter's life is the butter topic. Who is it? $10,000 might be a lot of bread, but your daughter's life is the butter topic. Who is it? So, as you can hear, the caller says, $10,000 might be a lot of bread, but your daughter's life is the buttered topping. The abductor hung up after making his statement, though the following day on June 29th, the Fox home received a letter in the mail making the exact same statement. In hopes of retrieving their daughter, David and Mary Fox immediately withdrew the money from the bank and waited for the abductor to contact them again to deliver instructions for an exchange. Just two days later, though, everything would change. Another letter arrived at the Fox home. Unlike the first letter, this one was signed suggesting a connection to the SLA, or Symbionese Liberation Army, the same group that had abducted Patty Hearst some five months earlier. The letter, in part, instructed the family to put the money in a box, quote, with blue wrapping, same as Margaret's blouse. Margaret is all right. We only tore her blouse and broke her glasses. Follow the instructions. End quote. But there were no more instructions. In fact, the family never heard from the abductor again. According to investigators, however, there was no active SLA group in the area, and it was believed the abductor simply chose the name after seeing it in headlines. At the time, it was unknown whether or not the letters, or maybe even the call, were legitimately from Margaret's abductor, or if these were pranks or someone trying to cash in on the tragedy. The truth has never been ascertained as to the veracity of these ransom demands, though the FBI has said they do believe the caller was legit. Fingerprints were recovered from at least one of the letters the family received, though those prints have never found a match and were allegedly lost later on. In hopes of narrowing down their search, police and the FBI focused on two different angles. First, they gathered the names and addresses of anyone in the area who owned a red Volkswagen. And beyond that, they began reaching out to speak to every man in the area named John Marshall. Authorities were also given access to notes written by Margaret about the potential job, as well as access to her diary. Margaret's diary, according to the Philadelphia Inquirer, discussed several instances in which she had been bullied in school and how she wished to move someplace warm, like Florida or California. While authorities do not believe that Margaret ran away, it did give a poignant look into the life of the 14-year-old. Many different men named John Marshall were subsequently interviewed by police, and while some made officers suspicious, there was never anything substantial enough to give them the ability to pursue a possible lead. Perhaps the most debated of the John Marshalls was the one who happened to work at the A&P grocery store in the same shopping center where the alleged John Marshall abductor had used the payphone. While many felt this was far too coincidental to not make a connection, others disagreed. This particular John Marshall was interviewed by police several times, passed a polygraph test, and had an alibi. He was working at the time of the abduction. Of course, the question became, would the abductor have actually given his real name in the first place? Perhaps the proximity of the payphone and the AMP John Marshall indicated, if nothing else, that the abductor may have been familiar with the area and possibly still living there. 
In hopes of gathering more information, a tip line was set up, which was initially run out of the prosecutor's office. However, while many tips came in, tracking them down used valuable time, and none of them ever panned out. Many tips revolved around men named John Marshall, though none of these appeared to be the abductor. Beyond that, tips were coming in from around the country as multiple people reported sightings of Margaret as far away as the West Coast, though again, none of these leads ever took investigators towards any answers. Many of the calls were from concerned parents whose own children had placed similar ads in the paper and they had received strange calls. However, by August, just some two months after her abduction, tips and leads began to fade and the amount of time investigators dedicated to the case was being whittled down. For the Fox family, it was devastating. Dave continued working to try and draw an attention for his daughter's case and to get her name and likeness out as much as possible, but it was clear that the pain and frustration were beginning to set in. In an interview with the Philadelphia Inquirer, Dave Fox would explain, quote, I haven't found out a thing, not one thing whatsoever. Some people feel it's hopeless. Sometimes I just accept that. It's that it's over and done, but then sometimes I get this feeling that she's alive that she's out there. I have a feeling that, in my search, she will break out and I will be there at the right time and place." End quote. There was never a day for the rest of his life that Dave wasn't trying to find Margaret. Joe Fox would describe the abduction as breaking his parents, that nothing would ever be the same and the search for their daughter would be all-consuming. Unfortunately, the case was rapidly growing cold. In May of 1976, investigators thought they may have finally received a break. A 53-year-old man named Charles Clobridge confessed to the abduction and murder of Margaret Fox. According to Clobridge, he had dumped the teen's body in the Catskill Mountains, but after thoroughly searching the area, no traces of Margaret were found. Investigators would go on to discover that Clobridge had actually been in the hospital the day of the abduction and he was later charged with giving false testimony to police. Clobridge was investigated despite his apparent alibi for the day of the abduction, but no links could ever be established, and his confession was written off as a cruel prank. There never really was a major break in Margaret's case. From time to time, a possibility came up or would be presented, but progress never developed. Detective Burr retired from his job in 1988 14 years after Margaret's abduction. Out of all the cases he worked, it was Margaret's that remained with him, and his frustrations over the lack of any solid leads is palpable in almost every interview he's ever given. In one of those interviews, Burr expressed his frustration, saying, quote, I was very disappointed during that time we were never able to bring closure to the family. End quote. In more recent years, there's been an open discussion from the side of law enforcement about the state of affairs at the time and how the system itself may have contributed to an inability to crack the case. Burlington Police Captain John Fine later told reporters, quote, There was little or no information sharing between agencies at that time. The only way you could get it was if you knew somebody or if you begged for it. End quote. In late December of 1988, a human skull was recovered on a hill in Atlantic Highlands. Once investigators were notified, a search of the area using cadaver dogs revealed human remains buried near the beach. The body had been buried less than two feet into the ground, with two car tires placed on top and then covered with dirt. Some partial clothing was found, including a platform sandal size six and a half, believed to have been manufactured sometime in the early to mid-1970s. The victim was initially believed to have been between the ages of 15 and 19, standing approximately 5 feet 1 inch to 5 feet 4 inches tall. Dental records were compared between the unknown victim and a murder victim from 1969, but they did not match. It was considered for a time that there could be a link between the Jane Doe and Margaret Fox, though it was around this time that it was discovered that Margaret's dental records, once in the hands of investigators, had been lost. This Jane Doe was later ruled out as being Margaret when familial DNA taken from one of her brothers was used for comparison. In the years since Margaret's disappearance, with the further development of DNA technology, there have thus far been 19 Jane Doe comparisons issued, none of which has ever matched. 
Throughout the course of the 1980s and 90s, Margaret's case received glimmers of attention. When an abduction took place or an anniversary year rolled around, there would be articles written to refer back to the 14-year-old who took a bus ride to a babysitting job and never returned. Unfortunately, the more time passed, the less seemed to develop, and while investigators have always maintained that Margaret's case was open, they did describe it as cold, and in an interview, Captain Fine discussed that while he wanted to have someone go through the case, he couldn't assign anyone to it. His detectives were already overwhelmed by recent cases, let alone one that had gone so cold. Captain Fine explained, quote, We haven't organized or analyzed records in 10 to 15 years, and I can't tax a detective who's working over 100 cases with that burden. End quote. In 1993, nearly 20 years after the disappearance of his daughter, David Fox passed away. He had devoted his life to finding Margaret, and while some days were darker than others, he maintained a hope that he would one day discover the truth. Sadly, he lost his life before that day could come. Ten years later, in August of 2003, Margaret's mother Mary also passed away, never knowing what happened to her daughter. In what I can only describe as a heartbreaking sentiment, Mary's obituary listed Margaret as one of her surviving children, never knowing for certain what truly became of her. Even today, while all investigators say that Margaret was likely abducted and murdered, she is still listed as missing and in danger. In April of 2017, Captain's Fine's interest for someone to have the time to dig into the files was fulfilled when retired Willingboro Police Detective Michael D'Alessio partnered with the Burlington Police to contribute his time and expertise on a volunteer basis to review Margaret's case. At the time, D'Alessio was handed several boxes filled with case files in hopes that he could dig through the information, organize it, take notes, and perhaps discover new avenues to explore. While D'Alessio was eager to get the opportunity, he tried to keep his expectations within reason, suggesting that while he would be digging into the case, he didn't expect to discover any new breaks. When speaking to the Burlington County Times, D'Alessio explained, quote, You just reanalyze the data and see if something jumps out at you, and you contact the authorities that were involved in the original case and see where it ended with them and why. End quote. While D'Alessio worked hard to bring as much information together as he could, there was little discovered in the reanalysis, at least little which has ever been shared publicly. However, the combination of D'Alessio's work and the 45th anniversary of Margaret's disappearance did drum up more attention in the media, especially when the FBI finally released the audio clip of the alleged abductor's phone call. When asked why they had kept the audio away from the public for so long, an FBI spokesman explained that the audio quality was very poor at the time it was recorded, and only recent upgrades to technology and audio enhancement had gotten the call to a level which they believed could be fully understood and analyzed by anyone listening. The announcement of the audio release made major headlines, and while the Fox family chose not to issue a statement, it was made clear that they were still hoping for answers as to what happened to Margaret. In a June 24, 2019 press release, the FBI stated, quote, Margaret Fox was loved dearly by her family and friends. To this day, her disappearance continues to cause great sorrow. End quote. It became clear that while many were not aware of Margaret's case, those in Burlington and neighboring cities have never forgotten her story. Captain John Fine later stated to the media, quote, the disappearance of Margaret Fox has haunted this community for decades. I want to bring closure to this case and bring home an answer to the family and community. End quote. After their request for new information and the release of the audio, a $25,000 reward has now been offered for information leading to the arrest of Fox's abductor. For 45 years, there's been the disturbing mystery of what happened to Margaret Fox. While authorities believe she was abducted, and sadly, that she was likely the victim of a homicide within the first hours or days after her abduction, there is still a vast wealth of questions requiring answers. All of these years later, few if any real leads have been developed, and for the most part, all authorities have to work with is the main theory that Margaret was abducted by a man calling himself John Marshall. However, there are some twists to that branch. 
One angle of the theory follows the thought process that Margaret was abducted and that the abduction itself was conducted by a total stranger who simply saw the ad in the paper and thought that Margaret would make an easy target. Sadly, this was not super uncommon back in the 1970s, and there's several other cases you can look at involving people being abducted following posts in the newspaper. Whether or not this was a transient, active serial pedophile or killer, or perhaps completely random, is still up for debate. But another angle to the theory, while maintaining that Margaret was abducted by someone based on her ad in the paper, goes a little further, wondering if perhaps the abductor may have, in some way, known Margaret or may have been familiar with her or her family. The demand, for instance, of $10,000 makes some wonder, if legitimate, whether or not the abductor would have known that the family had access to that kind of money, while others simply believe that the payphone near the A&P with a John Marshall employee is too close to just call a coincidence. 14-year-old Margaret Ellen Fox vanished after taking the bus at 8.40 a.m. on June 24, 1974. Margaret was last seen by a passenger on the bus talking to someone in a red car near the vicinity of Hill and Broad Streets in Mount Holly, New Jersey. When last seen, Margaret was described as being a Caucasian female with brown hair and blue eyes, standing 5 feet 2 inches tall and weighing approximately 105 pounds. Margaret was last seen wearing a light blue, long-sleeved, floral pattern blouse, squared at the top and flared at the waist. She also wore a checkered waist-length jacket, either black and white or black and blue, maroon flared jeans with a yellow patch on one knee, and brown sandals with a heel strap. She was also noted to have been wearing a size 34B bra, a gold necklace with flowers and a blue stone, and a gold charm bracelet with a blue stone. She was carrying a brown bag and was in possession of an eyeglass case with a huckleberry hound design. At the time of her disappearance, Margaret had freckles, was missing two of her top front right teeth, and she also wore glasses with hexagonal lenses, gold wire frames, and wear and tear on the temple and nose pieces. If alive today, Margaret would be 59 years old and age-progressed photographs are available. For nearly 50 years, her family and the entirety of the community of Burlington have wondered what became of the 14-year-old who stepped off the bus and vanished. While some remain optimistic about the possibilities, others have accepted the likelihood of her fate. Now, as best can be done, the hope is to bring forward answers, to deliver justice to the person responsible, and for Margaret herself to be returned where she may be laid to rest beside her parents. When asked about the likely outcome, should this case be solved, Detective D'Alessio replied, quote, To remain an optimist, I want to believe she's alive and just put everything behind her and just left her family and started a new life. And you know, she's happy somewhere and she's thrived and succeeded. But the realist in me, the police officer in me, says she never left Mount Holly. The disappearance of Margaret Ellen Fox is a difficult case to research. There's a lot of gaps in information, and honestly, what information we do have is somewhat minimal. We know about the events leading up to her disappearance, the call and the letter after, and that's about it. It seems pretty apparent to everyone who's examined this case that this was an abduction, but how all of these years later, not even a shred of evidence has ever surfaced is what really blows people's minds. Not a name, no new witnesses, nothing. No one has ever come forward with information despite Margaret's case being extremely well known in that area. The audio clip has only been out for a few months, but in that time, no one has recognized the caller as far as we know either. Unfortunately, the audio doesn't provide a lot to work with either. Before moving into the theories, I did just want to quickly address a handful of things I came across during my research. In a lot of places, I saw people questioning the Fox family themselves wondering why they'd allow their 14-year-old daughter to go off with a stranger for a babysitting job. It's really difficult to analyze the behaviors of parents 40 years ago versus what they are today. While we're inundated daily with information about the horrors of the world outside of our own homes and sometimes within them, it wasn't exactly the same back then. 
1974 was, in a way, the beginning of much of that. 74 is the year in which many of Ted Bundy's early known murders took place. It wouldn't be for another five or so years until missing children began appearing on milk cartons, and this was way before the era of 24-hour news networks that were available nationwide. So, it's very easy to look back in judgment about the situation. However, parents make poor decisions all the time. They just don't always end in tragedy. Maybe this was a poor decision on their part, to not at least meet the man their daughter was going to be working for, but it was sort of an age of innocence, or a coming to an end of that age, and I've never seen anything to suggest that Margaret's parents didn't do everything in their power to try and find her. I've seen in some places people who believe that there should be more suspicions about the family, and I don't necessarily agree, but hey, I guess that's an angle to take. On the other hand, all of the evidence seems to point to a non-familial abductor, so we have to deal with those theories as well. Really, when it comes down to examining the theories in this case, we're looking at two sides of the same coin. All of the theories revolve around the established knowledge that Margaret went to meet someone for a babysitting job and never returned. The ransom demands were made, and while the second letter is somewhat debated, the FBI does believe that the call itself was legitimate. In all likelihood, it seems apparent that someone saw the ad in the paper, made the call, and when they got connected with a 14-year-old girl, they decided to set this up and make their move. One detail about the initial call that I've always found fascinating was the fact that the caller, this alleged John Marshall, canceled their first meetup. For many, that's raised questions about the abductor himself and why he may or may not have had to have canceled that first arranged meeting and moved it to the following Monday. Why that initial meeting was canceled is up for debate, as is much of this case. Originally, Margaret was to get picked up at the bus stop by Marshall or his wife, if she existed, on Friday the 21st. But then the caller called back later, spoke to Margaret's father, and claimed that there was a death in the family, and he wouldn't be able to use Margaret until Monday. Some have gone on to argue that perhaps this indicated that the abductor had a family, or at a minimum, didn't live alone and so he had to shift the day to revolve around changes to someone else's schedule. Others think it's possible that the abductor may have been struggling to build up the nerve for the abduction and move things to Monday to give himself more time to get his courage up, for lack of a better description. This is a question we might never have the answer to, and whether or not it plays a major factor in terms of giving a clue as to the abductor's identity is impossible to say. So, we have to look at what details Margaret wrote down, the details that she was supposed to look for. Firstly, John Marshall said that either he or his wife would be waiting in the red Volkswagen at the bus stop. To me, that's weird to begin with since they could have just picked Margaret up at her home. It was only seven miles away, rather than making her ride a bus. But, all right, maybe you've got a busy morning and you can't pick her up. But the red Volkswagen is interesting. You have to wonder... Did the abductor actually own a red Volkswagen, or was he planning to show up in a different vehicle altogether and call out to Margaret and let her know, oh, sorry, I let my wife take the other car, just hop in with me? We know that the John Marshall name was likely an alias, so why would he give out the actual description of the vehicle he's planning to use to commit this crime? Maybe it was just the popularity of the time. Volkswagens were everywhere in the mid-1970s. So, this John Marshall did mention a supposed wife. Whether or not we believe he had a wife is up for debate, but it's entirely possible he could have had a female accomplice who would pick Margaret up for him. Of course, were there another person working with him, the chances of someone saying something may have been higher, but as we all know from this case, that never happened. I've often wondered about the possibility that he could have had a female accomplice who had been a previous abduction victim, someone that he had taken and groomed and once she got to a certain age, outside of his interests, he used his manipulative control to get her to assist in picking up potential victims. That's something we've seen in other cases. John Marshall also mentioned having a five-year-old son, but that seems likely to have been a detail used only to explain the need for a babysitter. Whether or not he truly had a family, I don't know, but I doubt that he actually had a young child at home. Then he mentions to Margaret that he has a pool and a swing set, Two pieces of information that are going to excite a 14-year-old. It's clear this guy wasn't new to this, or at least not entirely new to it. He had, to some degree, skill when it came to knowing what to say, and he had to have been somewhat of a smooth talker 
if he was able to disarm Margaret's parents when he spoke to them on the phone. I've never read confirmation anywhere about this, but I've always wondered if Mary Fox told authorities that she believed the ransom caller was the same man who had called about the babysitting job. The call was quick, but I do wonder if she recognized the voice. Focusing on the call audio, it's really difficult to discern a specific type of accent. I grew up on Long Island. I spent a lot of time around people with various Long Island accents, and trust me, there are several. Plus, upstate New York accents, city accents, northern New Jersey accents, and while this caller has some inflection that I find to be similar to that area, there are weird details about the pronunciation of specific words. A word that stands out to me in his call is daughter. There is a New York sound to the early half, daughter. The R is weird, though. Usually, with a heavy New York accent, it takes that aw sound in daughter and turns it into an aw sound, like daughter. But most of the time, the R gets cut off and you say daughter. Oftentimes, though, when I listen to this audio, I hear different sounds in different words. And I know people in New York who will say daughter, but I also know people who will say daughter. So it does seem to me that it's somewhat regional to that area, but there's something else influencing it. And I don't know if that's this person's attempt to conceal their accent or to put on a fake accent, but the voice doesn't sound natural. There's a measured quality to the voice. There's this pause when he says, your daughter's life is the buttered topping. It sounds like it's being read. Maybe it was rehearsed. We know the first letter was word for word the same thing in the call, so maybe the guy was just reading it. But it definitely doesn't sound natural, which makes me wonder if he was trying to cover up his accent. Then I have to comment on him saying buttered topping. I've never in my life heard anyone refer to butter on bread as a buttered topping. I've heard it in reference to movie theater popcorn, but I've never heard it in reference to bread. And I did grow up in a house where there was bread on the table that we would butter and eat. Maybe that doesn't matter, but it just sounds out of the ordinary. It's a weird call in general. And why make that call if you've already sent a letter saying the same exact thing? I swear, cases where there's audio from the alleged assailant always drive me nuts. I could spend hours just listening to that clip over and over again, so I'm going to play it a few times for you now. $10,000 might be a lot of bread, but your daughter's life is the buttered topping. Who is it? $10,000 might be a lot of bread, but your daughter's life is the buttered topping. Who is it? $10,000 might be a lot of bread, but your daughter's life is the buttered topping. Who is it? I don't know. I hear something different every time I listen to it. I'd really like to know what you hear in that call, what things you notice about it that are weird, and what kind of an accent you think that is, and whether or not it's a fake accent or someone trying to cover up an actual accent. So, I guess it's time to just look at the theory from the two different angles. We'll start with the idea that the abductor was a complete stranger and had no connection to Margaret or her family. In order for this person to have the number to call, they'd had to have seen the newspaper ad that was placed. This certainly wasn't placed in a national paper, so it had to have been someone in the area who read the ad and decided to act on it. Burlington is in a weird area as it's New Jersey, but it's also technically a suburb of Philadelphia, and it's right across the river from Pennsylvania. So you've got the possibility that this person could have lived in the area, Mount Holly, Burlington, Lumberton, or perhaps lived out of the state and worked in that area or passed through it. Either way, it seems like this guy had some familiarity with it. He knew the bus stop locations. He selected the payphone near the A&P. It was the mid-70s, so payphones were kind of everywhere, so why that particular location? It had to have been a phone he felt comfortable using. So, then we've got the name John Marshall. While John Marshall was a former Chief Justice of the United States, which certainly carries a sense of dark irony here, there are several schools in New Jersey named after John Marshall. Whether or not this name was chosen because of the Chief Justice connection or was a random name pulled off the front of a building, we may never know, but it's also a fairly common name. As we've learned about the employee of the AMP, also named John Marshall, although I should acknowledge that in some articles there was reference to an AMP employee named Jack Marshall, and frankly, I can't distinguish if that was a typo 
if maybe both a John and a Jack Marshall worked there, or if it was just an outright error. Either way, John Marshall isn't exactly a name that's going to stand out. Speaking of the A&P, though, I've seen debated on some forums the employee who was questioned. Remember, police interviewed a John Marshall from that A&P, partially because of his name and partially due to the job's proximity to the payphone. Now, this guy was questioned several times, provided an alibi, and took and passed a polygraph. Standing on its own, I don't think very much of a polygraph, but in conjunction with an alibi, that does kind of make me less likely to look at this guy. However, there is the chance that the abductor either knew this John Marshall or had been in that grocery store in the past and saw the name either on a name tag or maybe he heard it and decided to use it. Some people believe that the abductor may have been trying to point a finger at that AMP employee, though to me, that seems unlikely since this guy went pretty far to conceal his identity and I don't think it would make sense for him to make a possible connection that he could have in some way interacted with that AMP worker at some point in time. Ultimately, this person seems semi-familiar with the area, and as we know, oftentimes, these people will operate in areas they know because they're comfortable with them, and there's a good chance that the abductor either lived around there, worked around there, or lived within 20 or so miles of that area. If he frequented the A&P, if he drove around there a lot, stopped for breakfast or lunch, he could have easily picked up a newspaper and saw the babysitter ad as a prime opportunity. If there's one reason I believe there's more of a chance that the abductor was a total stranger, it's the fact that when he first placed his call, he was initially speaking to Margaret's cousin about her working for him. Allegedly, it wasn't until he found out that she was 11 years old that he appeared to lose interest. Aside from the fact that the cousin wasn't going to take the job anyway, it was too far away, it also seems that the so-called John Marshall was looking for an older girl. There's not much here to make me think that there was a connection beyond the ad. All evidence seems to indicate that the perpetrator was looking through ads, probably placed calls to more than one, and eventually locked in on the one he thought was easiest. We know he shifted the date for reasons we may never understand, and then on Monday, June 24th, executed his plan. The fact of the matter is, once Margaret got into this man's car, he could have driven for a little while before she'd start asking questions. If he knew the area well enough, he likely had a chosen route that would take her as far from populated areas as fast as possible. Whether that was across the Delaware into Pennsylvania, in another direction, or to his own home is anyone's guess. I do wonder why he chose Mount Holly as the pickup location. However, it's interesting to note that right between Mount Holly and Burlington is Interstate 295 and the Jersey Turnpike. It wouldn't have taken long to get onto an interstate from either area, and once the car was moving along the interstate, they could have gone anywhere. So what about the possibility that the abductor could have known Margaret, or had some connection to her, her family, or the community? Well, there's really not a lot of connections here to be made. Sure, someone who knew the family or Margaret may have known about the ad in the paper. Maybe the ad was used as a pretense to get Margaret alone, but no one recognized the caller's voice. So unless he was actively disguising it or working with an accomplice, you'd imagine that someone in the family would have noted something familiar in that audio clip. Beyond that, the call originally went to the cousin, so if Margaret was the target, why bother with this angle at all? We don't know a lot about Margaret's life, but it certainly doesn't seem as though she was out being a social butterfly at 14 years old. She had friends, sure, so you've got to consider other parents. She'd graduated from 8th grade, so maybe you've got to look at employees of the school. But no connection's ever been made to anyone who had any contact with Margaret, and pretty much anyone who ever knew Margaret was spoken to by police at some point in time. Not to mention, if someone who knew Margaret wanted to abduct her, they probably had easier methods by which to convince her to get into their car, rather than going through this whole scheme about babysitting. I mean, what if she hadn't decided to put an ad in the paper? Would she have been abducted by some other means, or would this have never taken place? The ransom demand has been debated a lot. If you're going to demand ransom, you'd better ensure that your target's able to pay it. Now, maybe this guy figured the family would go to the police and they would help fill in the missing funds. That's just speculation, though. $10,000 wasn't exactly a small amount of money back then, and nor is it today for most folks. And the Fox family weren't what I'd call rich. David worked as a plumber, and in some articles it said that he did some home repair work. 
That's not the kind of person I'd expect to just have $10,000 sitting around and available, although in this case, that did seem to happen. Could the abductor have known somehow that the Fox family had ten dollars available for the taking? Maybe, or maybe 10000 was just a nice round number. I've never seen much which led me to believe that there was any connection between the abductor and Margaret or her family. Maybe if he was someone working in the area or living in the area, he may have seen her at some point. But it still feels like by choosing to do this through the newspaper ad, this guy was establishing a lack of connection. Statistically speaking, child abductions are contained to three different types. Familial, acquaintance, and stranger. 43% of all child abductions are committed by a family member, with 27% being acquaintances and only 24% being strangers. However, 74% of non-family abductors target female victims, and while only one in every 10,000 abductions results in the child not being found alive, this rate rises to 20% when you're talking specifically about stranger abductions. There was a lot going on in this area at the time in terms of child abductions. From Jersey to Pennsylvania, it seemed as though there was a surge in child abductions. One name I came across in my research was that of Harvey Carnegie, the so-called want ad killer. Now, this guy was mostly active in the Pacific Northwest, Alaska, and Minnesota, and would use want ads to draw on potential victims, offering jobs and some work, and then when the person arrived for the interview, he'd strike. That's somewhat of a reversal of the situation, but it was hardly the first time nor the last that these kinds of crimes would happen. In fact, they still happen today. But in most cases, the connections are made digitally. Whether it's a dating app, Craigslist, or some random job board, there are people out there who choose this manner to hunt for their victims. I don't think Margaret herself was specifically targeted. I think this was random, and that adds to the frustration. And trust me, you're dealing with a lot of frustration when you look into Margaret's case. And I have a great amount of pity in my soul for the detectives who worked this case then and those who look at it today. There's not much to go on. The abductor did very well in covering his tracks, and whether or not Margaret is ever found or her killer identified remains to be seen. Unfortunately, a lot of time has passed. Margaret would be 59 years old today, and who knows what she could have built with her life. A career, a family, just a life all her own. If her killer was at least 20 at the time of the abduction, he'd be 65 today. Even if he was 30, he'd be 75, and so the possibility exists that he's still out there somewhere. How many cases have we seen solved thanks to new investigative techniques and DNA work lately? It's because of cases like that that I hold out hope that answers will be found in Margaret's case. However, unless those answers can be found, someone comes forward with new information, or we get an outright confession, the disappearance of Margaret Ellen Fox remains open unsolved, and very cold. If you're looking for information about the disappearance of Margaret Ellen Fox, there's a lot of news articles and forums out there discussing her case. I, as always, will post all sources on the website and in the show notes for this episode. Margaret has profiles on many different sites, including the Charlie Project, as well as NickMech, where you can find her case under NickMech number NCMC 959832. You can also look her case up in NCIC under case number M-1500603-1. If you have any information about the disappearance of Margaret Ellen Fox, please contact the Burlington City Police Department at area code 609-386-3300, case number 745503. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at traceevpod, email me at traceevidencepod at gmail.com, Instagram message me at Trace Evidence Pod or comment in the Facebook group. Now it's time to give a special thank you to our amazing Patreon producers. It's the beginning of a new month, so I've had to update the list. If you don't hear your name and you think that it should be here, please shoot me an email and let me know. I'll take a look. Patreon often doesn't make any sense in the way that it organizes things. But now, 
on to our fantastic producers. Tara Doble, Alicia Lorraine, Angie Dodd, Brittany Bivens, Brian Kemmerling, Krista Colvin, Diane Dyson, Eamon Brady, Emily Smith, Emma, Gerard Lopez Barbosa, Julia Rexon, Kate Alexander, Kelly Cohen, Laura Dickinson, Lisa Holly, Linda Halcrow, Nick Mohar Schurz, Quinn McBreen, Randy Wyland, Robbie Blue, Chandra Moreau, Thea Vandenberg, The Reigns of Yesteryear, Tom Archer, and Wannabe Sleuth 2. You're all awesome, and I am deeply thankful for your contributions to this show and for your commitment to keeping it going. It means a lot to me. A couple of quick updates here at the end of the show. Firstly, apologies about last week, but as I'm sure you could probably still hear in my voice, I got really sick, and I meant to take this week off and release an episode last week, but I had to do a flip-flop of the whole thing, so I hope that I've been able to make it up for you with this episode. Going forward, there should not be another week off until I go on my December break which will take place after I release episode 100 on December 9th. One last note before the end of the show, there's a good chance that come January, I'm going to be looking to hire a researcher. The podcast is finally in a position where I could be able to bring on an employee, and I would love to hire somebody who has experience doing research, who loves true crime, and who is detail-oriented as I am. So, In the coming weeks, probably in episode 100, but more than likely in episodes before that, I'll provide some kind of information on how you can apply for that position or send me a resume or something along those lines. But if it's something that you might be interested in, take some time, think about it, and the opportunity will be coming. So that's going to bring us to the end of this week's episode. Special thank you to any of you who have reached out to me about my health at the moment. I'm getting better. I still sound like a weirdo, but it's it's improving. I can get out of bed now, so that's positive. But it means a lot to me when you guys reach out and just want to make sure that I'm okay. So I want to thank you all for listening. And a very special shout out to all the soldiers out there, active, retired, all veterans. My father was a U.S. Marine combat veteran, and I know how much that means to him. And I hope all of you serving and who have served know how much you mean to us. Thank you for everything that you do. And thank you to all of you for listening, and I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.